they, they will take over menial jobs. But it's not going to be some sentient, conscious entity that's going to、um, be superior to us and wipe us out. Like、yeah. the, the the real danger is,、um, you know, some government. Like it, 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 the the danger has always been the same. It's still some government, some bureaucracy, having access to、uh, you know AI tools that give them excessive power in a single dimension that they can then use to have an advantage over others. So、welcome back to another episode of Bitcoin versus the Banks, and I'm joined here today by somebody that I've come to admire quite a bit in the space.、Uh, his name is Alex Svetsky. He is the co-author of the Uncommunist Manifesto. He's the founder of the Amber App,、uh, which allows you to buy Bitcoin DCA really easily, and he's also a guest contributor of Bitcoin Magazine. Thanks for being here. Thank you, Milan. Really appreciate it, man. Yeah, it's it's awesome that we were able to link up. Um, you know, like a lot of other people that I've been、uh, sort of speaking to in the space lately,、uh, you're somebody who's sort of diving down a different rabbit hole, and that is artificial intelligence. So I'm curious, like, what sparked that interest for you?、Um, the the original spark, I think, was、um, was actually a podcast I did on my own show when I was when I was running it a couple of years back、uh, with a guy called Rob Malka.、Um, And he's a Bitcoiner. He works, you know, he's doing stuff with the Bitcoin Policy Institute in the states. And um, and he wanted to do a podcast about AI. And at the time, it was、uh, when GP two GPT two just got released. Um, which for those who don't know, it's it's a couple orders of magnitude less performant than GPT three. Like it wasn't still, you know, the breakthrough moment. And I don't know. At the time, I just wasn't interested. You know, we started the conversation about AI, and then we ended up going onto his life story, and we ended up at Nietzsche and like all this other stuff. So, you know, that was sort of like the first little seed for me. And yeah, I think it was、um, the end of last year, really. You know, sort of with everybody else when ChatGPT came out,、um, I was like, "Hmm, what's this thing?" So I sort of started digging into what this was. I, I did my You know, initial thousand hours of like going down the rabbit hole, and to be honest, I've I've sort of come out the other end,、uh, not very impressed.、Um, I think it's a I think it's a fad.、Um, I think it's all hype.、Um, and I'm saying that as someone who's building a Bitcoin company now at the intersection of AI and、um, and Bitcoin. But、um, I I think yeah,、um, it is 99% hot air、um, and hype and stupidity and. You know, it just reminds me of the whole crypto blockchain scamminess,、um, and I think it's yeah, very, very, very、um, over, over, over exaggerated、uh, in terms of what, you know what the potential is. So we we can get into that in the pod. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. I've never heard anybody's take that way. So yeah, definitely want to come back to that.、Um, so I think there's a little bit of confusion among people as to like what AI actually is. So like my question、mm-hmm. to you is. How do you differentiate, you know, artificial intelligence from something like a robo vacuum or a lawnmower that can cut the grass on its own? I mean, I actually think it's all very similar, even language models.、Um, I, I don't think we have any form of artificial intelligence in the world. I don't think it exists.、Um, I'm not even sure it's possible.、Um, the more we play with language models and build our own, the more I realize that these things don't fit the word intelligence very well. If anything, they're probability machines.、Um, So, like, you know, when I I started writing a couple little articles、um, earlier this year, as I started going down this rabbit hole, and the question I was seeking to answer was, what is intelligence, and you know, what is artificial general intelligence? Like a lot of the、um, a lot of people, when you ask them like what their real fear about AI is, it's more to do with some sort of sentient being emerging out of the circuits, right? Like a Terminator esque sort of thing. Like.、Yeah. You know, you've, and you've got a cohort of people, you know, concerned about job replacement and stuff like that. But we always know, like, job replacement, all that kind of stuff is garbage because as soon as you replace one sort of job, you know, and and I sort of see that more under the banner of automation.、Um, you know, human beings just fill their time with something else,、um, and you either fill your time with like, you know, Netflix and social media and porn, or you fill your time with something, you know, useful like go and build a house, construct something with your hands, build a business. You know, find a woman, raise a family, do some jujitsu, like whatever. Like we've always got the choice, and having some more time in life is a good thing. You know, who gives a crap about、um, replacing jobs? So I think, you know, if you if you sort of do away with that more ignorant、um, and short sighted、uh, concern, you know, the other concern is that 
some sentient being is going to pop up and destroy all humans or take over the world or start using up our resources and look at us as you know some sort of annoying little bug that it needs to stamp out and get rid of right and i i just think that is so 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 fundamentally false uh it's not funny first from a from an impossibility standpoint um i think intelligence as a concept is very 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 poorly defined like when someone says intelligence like what do you mean like pattern recognition um you know do you mean memory you know like when you think about the human as a unit um you know you start to realize that we have way more than just cognitive intelligence and cerebral intelligence like we've got muscular intelligence hormonal and endocrine intelligence we've got you know uh skeletal intelligence we've got intuitive intelligence emotional intelligence you know and if you want to sort of get into the more metaphysical realm like this sort of spiritual connected conscious intelligence like we've got multiple layers of intelligences and you know when you look at what language models are and this is what makes me laugh about the nerds is that you know language models popped around and they're like oh my god agi is around the corner i'm like jesus christ like this is like language is a sliver of like cognitive intelligence, which is a sliver of, you know, the broader concept of intelligence just within the human paradigm, let alone like trees and plants and animals all have, you know, different types of intelligences. So, you know, when I, when I think about what, you know, the, this concept of general intelligence, you know, the, this ability for something, an entity to do multiple things uh, better than humans, um, I, I just don't think that that's a possibility. Um, and I, and if it was a possibility, I think we are so far from it. Um, and, and I'll tie off this sort of brain fight with, you know, one note is that what, what feels different about language models. And I think this is what's caught captured the imagination of people. And even the, um, the generative art stuff is that it's the first time something other than a human has been able to string together a sentence that we find coherent. Um, and we just automatically anthropomorphize it. Like, you know, if you think back before that, what was it? Nothing really could string a sentence together. I mean, other than like a parrot, you know, you teach a parrot how to say a couple of things, the parrot repeats it and you're like, oh my God, it's, you know, it's a human. And, you know, if a parrot says, you know, I'm going to kill all humans, you're like, yeah, whatever. Okay, it's just a parrot, you know, it's learned to repeat. Then if an AI says, I'm going to kill all humans, like it's a language model, we're like, oh my God, it's alive. Um, and people start to freak out. So I just think it's a, it's a unique time. And, um, and yeah, we're, we're just quick to project our own consciousness and our own intelligence onto something else, which you know, from firsthand experience in building a language model right now, we're going through it. And I can tell you that it's just probabilities. It's just laws, laws of large numbers. There's no reasoning there. There's no intelligence there. It's, it's completely absent of that stuff. Interesting. So you're calling it a fad and you see it as something that isn't, you know, there to potentially harm us. So I'm curious, where are you getting your information? Like, how are you learning about what AI is and sort of where it's going? A mixture of like building the stuff. Um, and then, uh, you know, my sources are sort of mixed up between, you know, cognitive psychology, uh, you know, just general philosophy and understanding, you know, how the mind functions. Um, I went down the rabbit hole of trying to understand, you know, oh man, what was his name? He was the guy who like really pioneered the the computational theory of mind. Um, his name is slipping my mind at the moment, but when I remember it, I'll mention it. Um, and yeah, I just, I just went into all of these like rabbit holes on what is consciousness, what is intelligence, you know, what are these things? There's a really great YouTube channel, which I've also forgotten the name of. I'll make sure I give it to you so you can put it in the show notes, but there's a lot of uh, uh, discussions there around the nature of consciousness, the nature of intelligence. And you see that there's a, there's a complete um, disagreement, at least in the, in the scientific and the philosophy, philosophical community about, you know, what this stuff is. Um, and you know, the, the nerds tend to like, particularly like, you know, the atheistic kind of, you know, Yuval Harari archetypes, they tend to believe that um, consciousness is emergent. And if you can strap together enough neurons, and I, I used to belong to that camp as well. Um, but the more I dug, the more I realized that there's, there's a lot more complexity there. And, you know, when you look at how, you know, the human developed, even if we did emerge, like if consciousness did emerge from, you know, quantum realm to the biological realm and all those sorts of layers trying to emulate that with um 
with electronic circuitry, I think is going to be very, very, very difficult. Like you can get machines to do things narrowly a lot better than humans. So like, you know, mathematics or, you know, anything that involves probabilities, basically machines will trump us in individual ways. But as soon as you start to combine and compound these things, and, and it was John Viveki, I think I was listening to a podcast with him and he mentioned something really good. And, and I'm going to paraphrase here. Um, but he, 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 postulated I think better than I will but it was something I had in the back of my mind I was writing about this and it's that when you start to you get multiple let's say you get a language model that is good at this you get a piece of AI that's good at this you get a piece of AI that's good at that and you start to string them together right and a lot of a lot of people are thinking this they're like okay look if we can put them together you know run multiple in parallel and then have like a governing agent that selects uh, which model to do what when you um, send it information and then if you cluster those groups together in some larger clusters, so that way you can manage more things in parallel, what you end up getting, and, th and this is like literally what the AI people are running into troubles now, is you get this exponential increase in the amount of computing power and energy required to operate this system. And then more importantly, with this broader and broader generalization, you actually slow the whole system down. You start to create like uh, governance bureaucracy inside this uh, intelligence hierarchy. And Vivek, you sort of said, you said, it might be that nature, through all of its experimentation over hundreds and millions and billions of years, actually arrived at humans as the ultimate mix of general intelligence across all of these disparate dimensions. Like, we aren't that good at, like, we're good enough at doing some math. You know, we're good enough at building a house. With, like, and, and we're very, like, we're competent enough across this whole range of things, um, you know, depth perception, like, we can drive a car, we can do all this sort of stuff. And you know, for, for a machine to ultimately be able to beat us across everything, I think all we're going to do in the end is like create a human. And, you know, we can actually do that today by just having babies. So it's like this, I almost see like when I call it a scam or a fad, I almost see it like the the hype, I think is very scammy. The, um, the over exuberance that like tomorrow we're going to create a AGI and everything like that, I think is completely off the mark. Um, but, you know, I, th I think there's definitely been a step change and we can talk about this in a minute, like in terms of what like language models in particular powered by transformer technology can do. But I think that is completely separate to AGI, the fears, the hyperbole and all of that. I like to place those two things in different camps. Interesting. So there's that expression, you know, somebody's the jack of all trades, master of none. Mm -hmm. To me, it's, it kind of sounds like your thesis is like, that's what a human is. It's like, we have all of these capabilities. We have our, you know, experiences and our knowledge which uh, makes us pretty good at various things. Whereas with, you know, some sort of machine, it's, it's sort of perfect at one particular task, namely things that are related to probability. Uh, and, and I guess that's what makes it so that we don't have to worry so much about them sort of taking over our jobs. Is that correct? I mean, no, they, they will take over menial jobs, but it's not going to be some sentient conscious entity that's going to um, be superior to us and wipe us out. Like okay. the, the, the real danger is, um, you know, some government, like it, 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 the, the danger has always been the same. It's still some government, some bureaucracy having access to, uh, you know, AI tools that give them excessive power in a single dimension that they can then use to have an advantage over others. That's always been the problem. It's, it's the same as, you know, having a nuke or um, being the only one with the computer or whatever. It's, it's the same story over and over again. It's not the AI is going to think about this stuff itself. It's that they, the idiots will use the AI for whatever purposes they deem for our safety or whatever, you know, they'll do some, they'll run the calculations and they'll, you know, cajole the AI into telling the world that the sun is the greatest danger to humanity. We need to block it out. And therefore we should do that. Like that, that's the kind of stupidity that I'm afraid of. And they'll justify it with the AI said so. Interesting. So knowing that it is uh, sort of this language model uh, technology, I, something that just came to mind is if I'm, let's say, using chat GPT and I'm in a foreign country, can I type in any language possible? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I just I never thought of that because, I, I mean, I solely use English when I use chat GPT. Yeah. So. More, more or less, right? Like, so because it's been trained on a larger corpus of English uh, data, it's, it's better in English, but, you know, more or less... Um, you know, I, I don't know the specifics as to how they've uh, trained it in multiple languages. And I know neural networks, if you basically, if you train them to uh, basically 
if you train them if you train them on translation techniques you'll end up in a situation where a model can actually uh, do translation very very well um, so it doesn't mean that it knows what it's saying but there's a probabilistic link between words and sentences and structures of sentences so that I mean you can go and ask chat GPT hey can you please convert this into Spanish and it's it's pretty good it's like about as good as Deeple or you know Google Translate and stuff like that okay yeah I was curious about that um so knowing it's that all patterns. Like, you know it, it, yeah it's all patterns like if, if I had to say one thing it's like the big breakthrough that we've had in AI is like we've realized that language is just another fractal of patterns um and it's not really like we all thought or you know i don't know if we all but a, a big part of the ai community thought that language was the key to intelligence we crack language we will ha like and i don't know if you ever read nick bostrom's book um uh, super intelligence no. it was like yeah about 10 it came out about 10 years ago and it was going around it was all the rage in the 2020s and i remember reading it when i was younger and i was like holy shit you know this is incredible blah 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 and I went back and read it um, earlier this year when I started going down my rabbit hole. I was like, this is the biggest pile of fucking junk I've ever read in my life. Um, and, and I think that's just after I've become a Bitcoiner, after I've like gone down the rabbit hole of like philosophy and all, all these other things, you start to like have some grounding in reality. And you start to realize that a lot of these like techno nerds and, and, and I keep kind of like, you know, sounding condescending towards them, but like, it's just because they're just so naive. And in there, there was like, you know, a classic chapter on how, uh, you know, the, the entire AI community thought that language was what's called a AI complete problem, which means if a machine was able to crack language, it, by the time we realized it, the machine would already be artificial general intelligence, it would be sentient, and it would hit that um, curve where it becomes super intelligent and takes over the world. So by the time we were able to communicate with the machine and, you know, have language come back, it's game over, the machines have already won. Well, and eh. Wrong on that one, pal. Like, you know, we got language eight months ago and all we've got is, you know, poem writing. <laughs> like, Right, right. Story writing, producing mm -hmm. what will be movies one day. Um, you've mentioned the word sentient a couple of times and I've heard various definitions of that. Like for something to be sentient, what does that mean to you? I mean, it's hard. I, I can't come to a definition of this myself. You know, I've played with it, you know, like sort of self-awareness, um, you know, then what the hell does self-awareness mean? You know, conscious, what the hell does conscious mean? Like th these things, like as soon as you start to try and define them, like they're so slippery a concept, we don't get it. So it's almost like the, it's the thing you can't define, but being conscious and sentient yourself, you kind of know it, uh, you know, it's like, well, you know, as Breathe Love would say, it's like the ineffable, like, you know, it's this, it's, it's the God thing. It's, you know, God is the thing you can't define, but you know, is there, um, you know, sentience is, is something that like you know has a has a will has a life force has a has an agency of some sort um and you know like it seems to me that human beings are the only things you know with that like um you know we we are part animals so we are part trainable we are you know we have patterns that we operate by but there seems to be some ingredient within us and you know call that sentience call it whatever that is um that seems to transcend uh, other kind of like there's a there's a clear delineation there's a zero to one between all other living things and human beings and and that i mean philosophers have been debating about this for thousands of years i don't think we're going to come up with a solution over a podcast so like you know that that's sort of you know i kind of like put that to the side and i say it's you know it's something that it's hard to define but we kind of know it's there uh because we are different right and, and speaking of different one of the things that i've always heard growing up that makes humans different from other animals is that we're capable of having some sort of abstract thought right we can sort of think outside the box whereas other creatures can't so do you, do you feel like a machine AI can do that? Can it think abstractly or, or are we sort of unique in that sense? Well, I don't know. I mean, that that's a Yuval Harari thing. Like he popularized that with his book. Um, and, you oh. know, mind you, like I did like his book um, early on. Like I, I can't stand the guy. I think, um, he, you know, he's an example of the kind of people that I think, you know, are very prone to, uh, you know, these runaway narratives. They sort of... Mm. Uh, I call them the brain in a vat maximalists. You know, they they sort of, you know, they kind of envision a day that we transcend the body. And and for me, I think 
the, the deepest intelligence actually lies in the body. Like, you know, mastery actually exists within the body. When you learn something to a deep enough degree, you know it here, you don't know it cerebrally. Um, so, and, and a lot of this stuff is, uh, is discounted, but, um, to come back to your question about abstract thought, um, I, I, I have found no evidence that any form of AI at the moment thinks it's just patterns, 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 law of large numbers. I, I don't see any thinking in there. Um, and that then, you know, brings up the question is like, what is thinking? You know, what is thought? Isn't thought just pattern recognition? I, I think it's something more than that. I think it's that pattern recognition mixed with some agency or some intent or some will. Um, and that together, I think, is what makes a uh, human being special. So if you take a, and this is why, you know, I mean, you look at the experiments, right? You've got humans, you've got machines, and then you've got human machines together, always beat the other two. Always, 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 always. Because you can mix the the pattern recognition and the direction of what humans sort of the, the will or the intent that the human wants to push the machine uh the direction of the machine into so i think um yeah to answer your question right now definitely not uh, in the future maybe you know never say never but um i'm 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 skeptical it's really fascinating man um and the reason i asked that question is um you know i i've already used like the ai image generator I've tried like the music generation and it's, it's incredible, but I guess as sort of you're alluding to a lot of that is just based on uh, past information and probabilities. Like, like I heard the, uh, it was a rendition of a Nirvana song. And I mean, it, it sounds like Kurt Cobain, but that's cause it's got that like sort of past experience that it can pull from right. That pattern. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That, that's what we've realized. We've realized that language and imagery is, you know, th there's a, there's a pattern layer of language and imagery. Um, and that's what we seem to have captured now with extremely large amounts of compute. Like if you think about how much, like how much energy does a human being, uh, use to try and, you know, conceptualize patterns, do depth recognition, everything. Like we just eat a little bit of food and we transform that energy into something that we can do better than just about every machine. Right. But for a machine to like almost match us in language, you need like some, ridiculous amount of gpus and electricity and everything it's far more inefficient uh than what a human uh is and a human can do all of these things we can produce art we can talk we can you know drive a car we can do all this sorts of stuff so it's um it's interesting and, and to sort of say something about the um the the image generation stuff so like the other day i was playing around with mid-journey i was trying to create a um an image of alexander the great going into battle uh against the persians um with his sarissa held um held up and charging against uh the persians at gorgamela right and you know you get these cool images but for the life of me man i like i was there for like two hours fucking around with prompts trying to get a sarissa not a sideways sword or some weird sort of like uh you know like angle of the sword i was like fucking hell so like what that tells you is there's there's no there's actually no direction you know that the 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 ai is not reasoning it doesn't understand it's just picking the words together you know those words translate into uh uh basically what's called uh vectors uh and the the vectors uh essentially numbers which then compute to particular patterns and it's all it's all numbers and probabilities all the way down um and you know you get something out which approximates what you've asked for and we we again we anthropomorphize it so we um imbue it with creativity we're like oh my god this is incredible um but i mean if you took patterns image patterns from you know and pixels from everywhere and you know tied all of those pixels to um to vectors and the vectors were tied to words you know and all of those sort of patterns you had you can kind of start to understand that you probably create some cool stuff by mixing and matching words together um, so you, you could actually go into mid journey and you can write complete nonsense and it'll produce you something, uh, because it's, it's patterns. It's not real creativity. I think that that's, you know, it's the missing element is that we humans can do pattern recognition, but we have something, uh, that's of sentient nature, something of will that almost like directs all of that to a point. Like it's almost reminds me of, you know, the. I don't know if this is the right physics analogy, but sort of Schrodinger's thing. It's like um, 
or maybe it's not showing anything. It's kind of like, you know, the, the wave experiment, like everything's a wave until you kind of look at it um, and then it becomes an electron, you know, and then when you look away from it, it becomes a wave. I'm or not I, I, I'm, Okay, I'm, I might be... I might be pointing to the wrong physics analogy, man. I've just, I've got so many things sort of scrambled in my head from, from the years. Um, but it's one of these things. It's like, it's in a particular state. Um, and then when you point attention to it or you look at it, it goes into another state. And I think that's what we do to reality and to probabilities. And I think machines lack that. So I watched a video on YouTube. It was a, it was actually a podcast with an expert who I, I'm pretty sure was a former uh, Google expert who was working on AI. And uh, th I mean, this video was like terrifying. It was very much a sort of doom or gloom sort of situation um, to the point where he said, like, if, um, if, if you're thinking of having children, wait, sort of to see like, okay, what's going to happen? Are we just going to get destroyed by these things in a matter of years, even months? Uh, it was just on that level of like, you know, doom or gloom. So do you have any idea like how rapidly this technology is evolving? Because like my understanding is anytime a new chip is put on the market, there's essentially like twice as much computing power. So it's just this exponential growth in intelligence. Uh, no, there's no exponential growth. We're already hitting plateaus. Like, you know, oh, really? the, I think, yeah, we're, we're in a, we're, in the, we're, I think near the top of the hype cycle and we're going to see, you know, this is going to be another Gartner kind of thing it's like we're going to see this whole thing collapse and crash and then you know over time we'll get that slow steady growth um so you know the the, the once again the nerds are very quick to extrapolate exponentials um they were the same during lockdowns and covid and all that sort of stuff it's the same thing it's like oh my god we're all gonna die and i think we just live in an age where because of the interconnectedness of the internet you know something pops up everyone freaks out, hysteria pops up, you know, and we extrapolate exponentials all the way through to infinity. And, you know, the machines are going to take over tomorrow. I, I, I put that stuff at a, basically a zero chance, like we're a 0 0.0000001 chance of happening. Um, I don't care if they're Google experts or who the fuck they are. Um, to me, they're just like out of touch with how reality works. They're, they're very good mathematically speaking, but they have zero grounding in like philosophy or just like the reality of life. Um, th things just don't happen like that. Yeah, that, make, that makes sense. I hear you. Um, I, I think part of like the naivety that we have comes from the fact that very, very few of us out there are actually like steeped in this. Like you are, you know, you're actually using the tech. Most of us I would say probably haven't even used AI in any sense. Like um, I, I work as a teacher and like when chat GPT mm -hmm. kind of became popularized, I was the one going around the staff saying, Oh, you got to try this. Like, check it out. Like we can use this for writing report cards. And some people dabbled in it a bit, but I think most people just like, it's totally foreign to them. Like I've mentioned it to my mom. She's like, what's AI again? So I, I think that's where it comes from is just this sort of like lack of not even understanding, just like exposure to it. So uh, well, I think it's easy a, to that's get a cultural caught up thing. in the fallacy of you know yeah. all of this taking over. Yeah, well, that's that's a cultural thing. This is this is this is what um you know people in the scientific community always forget, and that you know they always like laugh at religion, laugh at culture, laugh at all the. So you know you've kind of got like the study of matter that's empirical, and this is sort of where science and stuff like that lives. Then you have the study of what matters, which is like politics, philosophy, culture, you know, ethics, economics, and all this sort of stuff. And, and those two things, they operate from different paradigms. And, and, and you know, existence requires both um, because there's no point in having just the study of matter um, without understanding what matters, you know, because that deals with things like priority and meaning and all this sort of stuff. And th this is where, like, human beings, you know, uh, both, you know, machines, AI, and everything live in the realm of matter. And... Because people who are steeped in AI stuff, that's where all of their interest is. That's all of their study. That's that's their paradigm, their model of the world. And they completely discount this other side. And they don't realize things like culture exist. So they're like, yep, AI is going to fucking take over the world in three months, six months. And what do we find three months, six months later? Nobody really gives a fuck. Everybody's, you know, back on with their own lives. Um, you know, something else has caught their attention, you know, Nicki Minaj or whoever else is shaking their ass on Twitter. It's like mm -hmm. something else, right? Like human beings are like that. Like we, we, we have to, we have to take all of this noise and we have to filter it down to three to five things that actually matter um, consciously so that we can focus on that and we can make sense of the world. And um, 
and yeah, like th this is why I come back to, you know, I think we're in a hype cycle. And I, you know, when I say AI is a fad, I don't mean that it's going away. Like, I mean, we've every, like you said, people don't use AI and I, I guess maybe consciously don't, but like unconsciously, like anyone who's using Uber, anyone who's using fucking Google, anyone who's using any of these things, it's all AI. Like, you know, but I just, I've, I've started to hate that word because it's, you know, it's more like, you know, again, it's probabilities. That's all they're using. Like, you know, Uber calls their um their driver and rider matching algorithm artificially intelligent. It's not really intelligent. It's just a it's like a very powerful, highly accurate probability engine that matches drivers and riders together. That's what it's doing. Um, you know, in, intelligent to me would be like, uh, you know, can you ask that driver rider matching thing to, I don't know tell me what the meaning of life is or something like that. You know what I mean? Like it, it, it can't, it's very good there. Now you could sit down and tweak it and change it and do all this sort of stuff and then turn it into a language model that'll do that. But then the language model is very crap at booking riders and drivers, you know? So like th th this is, you know, this is the problem. So for somebody like yourself, who's actually using AI to essentially launch a business, you obviously see some value in it. So I'm curious, like how do humans stand to benefit from this technology? Yeah. So I think, as I said earlier, so language models and the transformer architecture that underlies them is very, very interesting because we've cracked language to some degree, at least. Um, and we've realized that language is, um, is, you know, uh, richly pattern oriented or pattern full. And because language makes up a lot of what we do in life, it's going to have a significant impact. Um, I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's the, there's the funny ironic side of the impact, which is, uh, you know, I was writing an article that I need to finish called midwit obsolescence technology, which is basically, um, you, you know, how you've got like CNN and vice and you sort of, your run of the mill people who are just like journalists and they, you know, they just write your just run of the mill Overton window crap. Right. All of those guys are in deep shit because chat GPT can do exactly that. Right. But if you've got some sort of opinion outside of the Overton window, if you like got an edgy opinion, ChatGPT ain't going to complete that because ChatGPT is being run through toxicity filters, approved speech, approved language, and all this kind of crap. So uh, in that sense, um, you know, the only jobs it's sort of replacing is this kind of middle of the bell curve midwit, you know, the, you know, the midwit meme, right? Like that sort of um, component on the bell curve uh, is, is in trouble. So, um, but anyway, okay. Coming back to um, where I see the value in this, it's like we're going to see a proliferation of content, honestly. Um, we're going to see a hell of a lot more junk. Um, we are going to need to figure out how to filter through that junk, which I think may also use some sort of language model summarization techniques or stuff like that. And this is part of what we're trying to do is so we're we're taking an approach where the language model we're building is from scratch so we're not building it on the back of open ai and like plug it into a vector database and crap like that we're actually training from scratch and we are doing it on a corpus of data that is uh kind of like bitcoin centric and austrian economic centric and, and the reason i like that mix is because the the concepts themselves are rooted in a set of principles you know that at least i and the people I'm doing it with align to. Um, and it touches things like philosophy, anthropology, economics, you know, politics, ethics, and all that sort of stuff. So, so there's a there's a there's an embedded bias, there's an embedded opinion, which is actually outside of that mid bell curve crap. So, you know, our model might sit to here on the on the bell curve. And what that's gonna produce is stuff out the other end that is different to what ChatGPT will produce. And someone who might want to produce more edgy content or who might want to find insights or correlations, you know, I might want to say, hey, what do Nietzsche and Jordan Peterson disagree on uh, that, you know, Seyfedin Amos might say or something like that, you know, and ChatGPT might have a hard time you know, producing something meaningful there it might just give you some run of the mill crap, you know, and apologize on the first paragraph, apologize on the last paragraph, you know, our model might actually give you something that you're like, oh, shit, I didn't think of that. And you might be able to use that um, for, you know, for something. Um, so, so I, I think, you know, 
it's dangerous because I don't want to say too strongly, like if you don't use this stuff, you're going to be left behind. Cause I, I disagree with that. Um, I think if you become too dependent on a machine to do uh, too much of your thinking, you'll lose your own capacity to think, you know, like thinking is a muscle, yeah, you know, if, and, and just like any muscle, if you don't use it, you lose it. Right. So, you know, where, where my, um, where my instinct tells me to go, it's like, okay, can you use something like this for ideation? Can you use it for um, for automating some menial tasks? Um, can you use it for anything that you would otherwise have had to, you know, get somebody? I was speaking to somebody yesterday on a podcast saying, like, you know, video editing. It's like, you know, get someone to push this button, push this button, push this button. You know, can you figure out what that pattern is and train a model to do that pattern? You know, the model is not going to be able to think intelligently at some particular point in time. So what you might get at the end of it is like something that's okay. It's like 80% of the way there, which, you know, you throw a human on top of it can fix up the end. So, you know, might be able to like help us, you know, automate a bunch of stuff. And that, as we said earlier, right, will open up more time for you to do other things, you know, that are of a higher order. So I think that's the case, but arguably that's always been the case with automation, right? Mm -hmm. Like, why do we why do we drive cars why do we do you know why do we build buildings with cranes and all that sort of stuff we do all of that sort of stuff to create more time and then all we do is we just fill that time with other stuff so it's the same old same old story um it's just a new paradigm and it's one that is going to impact language art and all of that sort of stuff and we ourselves just want to build a an alternative to mainstream kind of language models, which I believe, in my opinion, are going to become less useful and ironically useful, you know, as I said earlier, like less useful because like people with something of substance to say, just not going to be able to use it and be like, fuck this thing drives me crazy drives me crazy because like I know chat GPT drives me crazy. Like un unless I want to know something technical or something like uh, objective, like chat GPT is great for that. But as soon as I want something a little bit more opinionated, I have to do it myself. And and that's fine. You know, it forces me to use my brain. Um, but useful in the sense that I find it ironic and hilarious that a lot of the, um, you know, the, the midwit world is going to find themselves without a job, which to me is kind of funny. So, but that's my... Uh, Sheldon Freud or whatever it's called, um, you know, laughing at others. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, strange. I actually had a, but, uh, I had a similar experience the other day. I was, uh, I was using chat GPT. I was trying to create a shit post for Twitter or X now. Mm -hmm. Um, and I just kind of played around with it and I was like, write a shit post about the economy or I forget what the topic was. And it was like, sorry, I can't do that. Don't want to offend anybody. And I tried that yeah, with yeah. a couple, couple different things. And so it's, as you said, it's kind of narrowing. The, the sort of playing field of what can and cannot be said. So I imagine that when your company finally launches their product, you guys are going to produce the results that everybody who is sort of like uh, cast out of this sort of chat GPT world, they're going to turn to you guys and go, Hey, it's actually like what I'm looking for. So that's, that's pretty yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I hope so. I hope so. It's going to be very interesting to see what comes out the other end of this. Um, I mean, there was the, there was a funny story. I saw it like a week ago or something like that. Um, I think it was Meta or someone, one of the big companies, they they went and took all of like something like 35,000 scientific journals. And, you know, scientific journals are, you know, very abstract, very, you know, dry in what they're written. And they're, you know, like aimed to be factual. And they trained up a language model on it. And they had to shut it down after two days because of misinformation. <laughs> so... You know, what that means is like, you know, they didn't put the guardrails on it. They're like, oh, fuck, it's, it's dropping too many truth bombs. Quick, turn it off. Um, you know, because like, they, you know, these models are just a reflection of what you feed them, right? Um, and yeah, it's, for, for me, I, I will mention one thing. And this is, this is part of, I think, the mission driver for us with Spirit of Satoshi is um, I, I do think as much as I laugh at the, um, you know, the AGI threats and all that sort of stuff, I actually do think there is a legitimate threat with um, with this new era of AI and particularly language models. And, and that's this is. Um, think about what um, what the Internet was when it first came out, right? The Internet was this kind of like new world in cyberspace where we, you know, talk, find different ideas. And, you know, there's all these cracks and corners and, you know, of the Internet where 
it's like a, like an idea verse, right? And you know, the, the more it grew, the harder it was to find these things. So someone came along, which we all know, and solved that problem. It was called Google. And they figured out a way to index, essentially, the web um, and allow us to find information quicker, easier. But over time, what happened is, you know, the internet became less the internet, became more Google search, right? Like, I, I still remember in the early days, like, I used to go to page two, three, four, five of Google. Nobody fucking does that anymore. I mean, people don't, it's not only that they don't go past page one, they don't go past like the first three results. Like yeah. it's literally that. So, so then people's model of the world has just become that, right? It is like the first three results on Google. People's like social media has done it the same, just in a slightly different way through the algorithms. Like people's model of the world has become what does Twitter show me? What does Instagram show me? What does Facebook show me? Right. So with language models in particular is like we're, we're evolving we're kind of entering the realm or the era of a language user interface. And my my guess is that in the next two, three, four, five years, instead of asking Google any question, I think you're just going to ask your language model. And whatever the language model spits back out at you, that's going to be your truth. People are going to be too lazy to go and figure it out, see if it's true or whatever, right? So you can kind of see where I'm going with this, right? Is Now, Excellent. if you go upstream of this, and you start to have regulation around what can be said or what ideas are good, you know, what language is okay. Like, you know, the basically the idea in the language police, you can narrow this down and people's perception of the world becomes what they are told by their model. And it's almost like a, you know, the movie Inception. You like basically incept these ideas and like basically you turn all humans into these zombies that, you know, whatever, whatever the regime says is the thing, you know, fed through the language models, that is truth, that is reality. Like it's like an Orwellian dream if you really think about uh, where something like this can go. And for me, like I, I went on a couple of tirades earlier this year um, about when they started talking about AI safety. And this is where I really like started pushing back against the AGI narrative. I was like, man, the AGI narrative is a freaking red herring. It is a distraction because it, it's, it's grand enough, large enough, and nebulous enough and abstract enough that people can be very easily afraid of it because they just don't understand. Like, oh my God, AGI is going to kill us all. Yes, we need a regulatory body to regulate AI. And when you dig a little bit deeper and you see what the regulatory body is doing, they are regulating discourse and language for language models. So it's literally like, it, like AGI is the red herring, confuse everyone. Hey, look over here. And then here, you know, classic magician sleight, sleight of hand, they are instituting what language models can and cannot say, you know, what toxicity filters they all need to be run through. Like, and this is why we chose to go open source because we're like, screw you. Like, you know, we're not going to be stuck in a position where in order for anybody to use us, we're going to be forced to run our model through a toxicity filter. Get fucked. Like, you know, we're, we're going to keep this as open as possible. So this is where like, I, I genuinely, if there was a danger in AI, that is the danger is like this, this slow conformity of people's minds, opinions, knowledge, and understanding of the world into this narrow, like uh, shadow of reality. And to combat that, I mean, the same way as Bitcoin combats fiat by being a better alternative, we want to combat mainstream AI by being a better alternative. And that's sort of like that. That's really the the core mission behind what we're trying to do. That that's really cool, man. That sounds like really admirable, and it sounds like something that I, I mean, I could definitely get on board with. Um, you know, we live in a world now with so much cancel culture, so many things you just cannot say. Like every time I do this show, I'm like, what am I going to say that's going to get me canceled, or this is going to just piss somebody off for something that really sh like shouldn't? And the thing mm -hmm. is, like. We're, we're no longer allowed to have a proper you know dialogue with one another because it's like the moment you say something either you get canceled or somebody's like oh you were out of line you, you shouldn't have said that it's like okay maybe i misspoke this doesn't mean i you know intentionally said something to harm you maybe it was just a slip of the tongue maybe you took it out of context like i think what you guys are doing is going to essentially make sure that that sort of thing doesn't become the dominant sort of way of society so i i love it man um, Thanks, I know, man. I know you don't have a lot of time, so I, I do want to get to one last question because this is a Bitcoin yep. show. Um, sure. you know, people are already transacting financially with machines and I keep hearing that machines are going to be interacting with machines. So how does like Bitcoin play into all of this? Yeah. I mean, that, that's, that's a pretty 
easy one, right? So like when people say machines are going to be transacting machines, you know, you might want to like, once again, th think of these like language models as uh, these non-sentient uh, agents that are probability machines that might be able to go and complete a task or a series of tasks for you, which are traditionally some sort of pattern-like task. Could be research this, get some information on this. You know, if you need to get information, here's a budget to purchase this subscription that you think isn't you know, necessary, blah, 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 and come back to me with whatever. So if you want to do that, I mean, trying to give a language model, you know, access to a credit card, good luck. You know, you can't open a bank account. Like, it's not a person. It's not a thing. You know, you're not going to be able to do that. So you need some sort of digital, internet-native monetary instrument. And what, you're going to use Dogecoin? You know, Ethereum? Like, no. Like, all this stuff is stupidity. So, like, what, what's, what is the most functional, valuable, useful, uh, sound money of the internet ding 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 bitcoin so it's like a no-brainer um and yeah I, I just think that there's a there's an incredible opportunity there now that's not to say like yep you know tomorrow we're gonna have you know ridiculous amount of transactions you know happening uh on the bitcoin network due to machines you know no like there, there's a long way to go like i mean we 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 messed around with some agent stuff to go and like basically build like a little mini Bitcoin research agent and you know have you know spin up a language model to go and like search out information you know summarize and do all that sort of stuff. We use ChatGPT for it, like their API, because our model's not ready yet. And I mean the the, the quality of research you get back is garbage at this point. Like it's just we're just not there yet. We're we're far away from that. Um, and you know you wouldn't entrust a language model with more than you know. 10,000, 20,000 sats, but it's also predicated on, you know, the sources that it might need to go and draw information from, like, let's say it needs to draw information from Substack. I mean, Substack's not Bitcoin enabled. So, you right. know, there's a, there's a blocker there. So, so we, we, we have, I think a bit of a way to go. And I think, um, I think once again, the, the Bitcoin community is also prone to a little bit of hyperbole, like, uh, you know, everyone's going to start like, you know, lightning solves this. Um, I'm like, well, no, because there's accounting problems, like particularly like if you're a US company and like, you know, I said this about open AI, people are like, oh, you know, if we can convince open AI to do the reinforcement learning training in, um, in Bitcoin, or if instead of charging $20 a month, they just charge in lightning whenever you use chat GPT. I'm like, yeah, that sounds good on the surface, but do you realize as a US company, they would have to convert every single Bitcoin microtransaction into dollars. And even if they don't convert it, you know, at the same time, like in sort of these microtransactions, they have to account for it at that time in dollars. That would send their accounting bill through the fucking roof because they would have to do all of that stuff. So it'll probably cost them more, like it'll probably cost them 10 times more to do to implement Lightning than it would save them from the, you know, the automation of the microtransaction. So it's like, it's easy to be, you know, optimistic about all this sort of stuff. You know, when you look at it, just the tech, purely the technological things, like, yes, it's an obvious technological solution, but it's not a, you know, practical accounting or economic or, uh, you know, governance solution. And all of these sort of layers exist in the world. So it's going to take us a while. Um, you know, once again, I, you know, I don't mean to be a party pooper, but like, you know, th these things take time. And, you know, I hope to be a, you know, maybe a voice of like temperance and reason, both for AI and for Bitcoin stuff. Um, and once again, saying it as somebody who's building in AI and Bitcoin, literally, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not the man out of the arena pointing at people and laughing. Like I'm the man in the arena and I'm pointing at myself and laughing. Um, yeah, saying, no, I hey, get it, man. This is going to take a while. I, I think you're you're a realist, you know, like you understand, like you said, there's advantages to using Bitcoin, but at the same time, you've got these sort of regulatory hurdles that we've got to get through first before we see that proliferation of it being used across all platforms. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I, I know we're pretty much out of time. So first of all, thank you for, for so much for being here. This, this has been freaking cool. like amazing. Um, if people want to learn more about your project or just kind of maybe reach out to you, where can they find you? Yeah, absolutely. So the easiest is uh, Svetsky writes on Twitter. So S V E T S K I and then writes like writing R I T E S. Um, sorry, W R I T E S. Jesus Christ, I got to spell. Um, <laughs> but uh, what, what I actually have a like, so if there's Bitcoin listeners and everything, and you know, I extend this invite to you is 
what we're doing right now is um, we, we've been collecting, curating, and uh, cleaning up data for the for the language model. And we, I mean, we are a Bitcoin denominated company, and we uh, and allowing Bitcoiners to come and help us train the model and structure the data uh, that is being fed to the model. So, you know, people are always going out there saying, "Hey." We need open source alternatives. You know, we need to we need to build alternatives and all this sort of stuff. Like we're actually giving the Bitcoin community. We got people from like Philippines, Salvador, Africa, Europe, uh, Australia, America, and everything like contributing to this, and we're calling it proof of knowledge. So if you've got some Bitcoin knowledge, if you've learned something about Bitcoin, you want to sort of like test yourself out or like contribute and like to a, a bigger project, but also earn some sats. Like we got people earning thousands of sats uh, daily, weekly. Um, just by you know contributing and and all it is is like helping clean up data so it's like you'll see a question and answer pair and you'll be like okay that's like broken because we've gone and for example transcribed all of the bitcoin podcasts and then we've programmatically cleaned them up but even with programmatic cleanup you still get some junk in there like you know inside a podcast you know you and i talking about what i ate for breakfast last week like and, and you know you get a lot of that kind of noise in podcasts so some of that stuff needs to be removed um, there's things like we've got a section in there called Fudbuster where you can earn like extra sats and you can emulate how a Satoshi model would answer a particular FUD. Like, you know, does Bitcoin use too much energy? You know, is Bitcoin going to boil the oceans? You know, uh, Bitcoin transactions too slow, whatever. And you can actually contribute to that data pool uh, and help us actually round out this um, this model in the final innings. So. To get into that, um, spiritofsatoshi.ai, there's a little form there where we ask you a couple of questions because we're trying to like vet the um, the best people to come in. So like the community is a couple hundred strong at the moment around the world. Um, so yeah, it's it's a way to earn some sats. Um, it's a way to be involved in a what I think is a meaningful project uh, for Bitcoin and for the world. And it's a way to sort of put your mark uh, on this as well. Um, so yeah, that's my that's my probably call to action off the back of this. But yeah, other than that, if people want to follow along, um, hit me up, uh, Svetsky writes on Twitter and rock and roll. Awesome, man. Thank you so much. I'm definitely going to check it out and I'd uh, love to get you back on. Maybe next time we can even get Mark Moss on here. I'd love to talk about your book. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, um, I'll, I'll twist his arm. We'll, we'll make that happen towards the end of the year. All right, buddy. I'll let you go. Take care. Thanks Pleasure. so much. Thank you, Milan. Ciao.